Next, we're going to be hearing from Carrie Wilson. She's a child neurology resident who's been rotating on the neuro-ophthalmology service here. And she's going to be talking about a, a case presentation. So thanks, Carrie. Yeah. Hi, nice to meet you. <coughs> yeah, so oh, let me start from the beginning. So um, thank you. Yeah, my name's Carrie Wilson. I'm a third year resident, but a first year pediatric neurology fellow at the U. And um, I'm going to be presenting a pediatric neuro-ophthalmology case that I encountered Unfortunately, not on the neuro-ophthalmology month, but apparently they're everywhere. Uh, so my case is a 17-year-old male who does have a history of Bichette's disease. Uh, and he was coming in saying that he cannot see from the bottom part of his left eye. He, uh, two years prior to this incident, had completely lost vision in his right eye over time. And he's now presenting with two weeks of decreased vision in the inferior visual field of his left eye. The, um, the vision loss was initially, initially blurry, but he's had no pain or other symptoms. And the only other preceding event was that he was <laughs> hit by a car while on his bicycle one week prior to the vision loss. He had no loss of consciousness, but he developed a headache after that time, which was then persisting and actually worsened on the day that he started developing vision loss in his left eye. So this is just a quick review of the retinal photos of his right eye. You can see the sense of damage there. And that was actually thought to be due to a central retinal artery occlusion. So in terms of his past medical history, he was um, extensively worked up at the time of his right eye, uh, right vision loss. And at that time, almost all of the testing was negative except for HLA B51 positive which uh, some of you may remember is associated with Bichette's disease, as well as some oral aphthous ulcers, which is why he was diagnosed with Bichette's two years ago. He had a lumbar puncture performed with mildly elevated CSF protein, but no other symptoms or medical history. There's no family history in this patient, um, no one else with autoimmune disease. He's been managed on Plaquenil since the vision loss two years ago, which has been managing his aphthous ulcers quite well. So prior to the university hospital admission, he was admitted to St. Mark's in Idaho, where they started IV, high-dose IV steroids to try to decrease some of the inflammation they thought was causing his vision loss in the left eye. Unfortunately, he was not responding and therefore started on aspirin, aspirin, Trental, and bromonidine. Um, unfortunately, they thought that his vision loss was worsening and he was transferred to University Hospital. When we met him, we almost immediately sent him to the Moran Eye Center for evaluation by one of our neuro-ophthalmologists uh, who had been in contact with one of his ophthalmologists and rheumatologists in Idaho. So uh, consistent with prior exams, his right eye showed visual acuity just to hand motion and on the left it was 2015. He did have a right afferent pupillary defect. Color vision in his left eye was normal. Slit lamp exam was unremarkable. And MRI brain and optic nerves were surprisingly normal. On the Humphrey visual field test, you can see that he has uh, inferior, visual or, um, inferior visual field defect, ocular defect. Um, and then if you see, so this is the retinal photos of his right eye from September. This is different from the one that I showed you earlier from two years ago. Um, and this one, of course, is just showing severe optic nerve um, pallor and some arteriolar attenuation throughout the posterior pole. And we think that the most likely etiology, although we didn't see the patient at that time, was due to a central retinal artery occlusion. So then you look at his left eye, and you can see in the superior portion um, of his optic disc some pallor, as well as mild optic disc edema, some scattered hemorrhages superiorly, and otherwise normal arterioles. On fluorescein angiography, this is um, 12 seconds in, and you can start to see some, I guess, I don't know if I can point. You guys probably know where all of this is better than I do. Mm, maybe not. Well, there's the optic, uh, you can see the optic nerve here. This is his left eye. 
only the inferior portion is starting to enhance early after the dye is injected, which is abnormal. And even as the choroid continues to brighten, the inferior portion of the optic nerve is the only part that's enhancing. The superior portion remains dark. And as we move through, this is a little bit further in, again, the um, central retinal artery appears to be okay because there's continued enhancement of the vasculature, but not the superior portion of the optic disc. And it's not till three minutes and finally at seven minutes into this that the optic disc really starts to brighten. So um, after a discussion uh, with a few different subspecialists, it was identified that this is appears to be an atypical presentation of neurobachette's disease. Uh, he has a vasoocclusive pattern in the posterior ciliary artery, causing that decreased perfusion to the superior left optic nerve, and then of course his continued um, optic nerve atrophy on the right. So I think why, to understand why this is atypical, we have to understand what a more typical course of Bichette's disease would be, and this is just a review of the diagnostic criteri criteria. So usually you'll have recurrent oral ulcers, <coughs> plus two of genital ulcers, eye involvement, usually anterior or posterior uveitis, skin lesions, and a positive pathergy test. About 10 to 20 percent of these Bichette's disease cases will be classified as neurobichettes, although that number might be higher in the pediatric population. So neurobichettes is sort of uh, separated into three different areas. You have either central nervous system or peripheral nervous system involvement. And within the central nervous system, you can either have parenchymal involvement, which is typically of the brainstem, but can include hemisphere, spinal cord, or um, meningoencephalitis. One of the typical symptoms of that would be headaches, which this patient did have. Unfortunately, well, fortunately for him, but unfortunately for understanding his pathophysiology, he had a negative MRI. Though he did have this history of elevated CSF protein. And then there's also <coughs> a separate entity within CNS disease, which is the neurovascular Bichette's disease. And there's some debate as to whether or not this is just a symptom of the vasculitis that we know is involved in Bichette's versus is this actual central nervous system involvement. But at this point, it's still considered neurobichettes if you have a form of arterial occlusion like our patient did. And you can get stroke-like symptoms from that or optic nerve, uh, decreased perfusion of the optic nerve like in our patient. And then to remind us of the typical ocular manifestations of Bichette's disease, um, since the eye is, one of the, is the number one organ involved, that typically you'll see uveitis that can be anterior or posterior um, and posterior uveitis is actually seen in 75 percent of pediatric cases. Vasculitis or a periphlebitis is seen in approximately 80 percent of Bichette's patients and you can see edema especially for example on fluorescein angiography you can see edema, vascular leakage, vascular wall staining, with forms of obliterative vasculitis, macular edema is a common complication, and neovascularization is often seen with episodic vaso-occlusion. So none of these eye findings were actually seen in our patient, which is part of what makes him a more atypical presentation. So understanding why he had this arterial occlusion if it's not a form of vaso-occlusion or, or a vasculitis or spasm um, there are theories in looking at the pathophysiology of Bichette's disease that's still under review that it could be an immunoglobulin and complement deposition within the vasculature. It could, of course, be a clot secondary to endothelial damage and inflammation with his autoimmune disease. And as we know, he had this head injury and how that exacerbated his symptoms. It certainly correlates in time and his symptoms, but it's unclear if this was um, how much of a problem, you know, how much of a cause this played for this patient's symptoms. So moving forward with our management of him, um, the general goals of treatment of Bichette's disease is during an attack, of course, you want to decrease the acute inflammation if it's present, and moving, looking forward, you want to decrease severity and frequency of attacks. 
as well as decreased complications related to them. Some patients, for example, if there's anterior uveitis, you might be able to start with topical steroids. Uh, if there's more significant symptoms or posterior uveitis or symptoms like our patient presented with, you'll start with systemic steroids with a very slow taper. Unfortunately, our patient did not respond to IV steroids, and therefore the next step would be moving towards immunosuppressive or immunomodulating therapy. So for our patient MB, we started in flip after consulting with our rheumatologists as well as neuro-ophthalmologists. Uh, this is a TNF-alpha inhibitor, and it's been shown that in some case, in many cases of the SHET, patients do have elevated serum and aqueous levels of TNF-alpha, which is why they think this might be a new or um, more effective therapy for many of these patients with severe symptoms. And the goal is to decrease frequency of attacks, which this has been shown to do in many of the patients. But of course, it's best in combination therapy. And this poor patient is going back to Idaho on infliximab, methotrexate, aspirin, a steroid taper, plaquenil, bimonidine, and Trental. He, of course, has close follow-up with his rheumatologist and a neuro-ophthalmologist. So overall, just reminding us to think about the Schett's disease, especially um, since the eye is the most commonly involved organ. Um, typical symptoms are oral ulcers, genital ulcers, vasculitis in any part of the body, and typically uveitis. Uh, steroids are a first-line treatment, but often in severe cases you have to move to immunomodulation. And especially in the pediatric population, while you don't want to go testing everyone for HLA, B51 for every headache, often in the pediatric realm, ne uh, neurologic symptoms could be the first presenting symptom of one of these autoimmune diseases or Bichette's disease. And so thinking about neuro Bichette's in any patient with headaches, um, a you know, stroke at a young age, intracranial hypertension, sinus venous thrombosis, or under other unusual neurologic symptoms. So, and working with colleagues in rheumatology and neurology and ophthalmology you to utilize a multidisciplinary team approach is best for the patient. So these are some of my resources and that's it. It is. Right. Not method, it, he was on azathioprine before he came in, that's right. We switched it to methotrexate. 17. Yeah, I was gonna ask, is there, is there obviously a range you can take it, but the guidelines, uh, you know, uh, 20 and 
Yeah, sorry I can't point. <laughs> oh. Hopefully. Oh, I didn't. He's a white, English, Scottish background. Not typical, yeah, what you'd think kind of that silk route of the Shetz disease which is also interesting looking, trying to look up information because the majority of the research is not necessarily being done here where we don't see it as commonly. Japan, Japan well Turkey, Australia, yeah. If you look at our population and see that it's like that, it's like that. It's like it's In the middle of Idaho. <laughs> Yeah, it's a tricky diagnosis to make. Mm -hmm. And I think just to go back to your initial question about the prognosis for this patient, and it certainly because this is such an unusual presentation of the Shetz, it's hard to know, you know, just what else sort of he could have ischemia to and why have both of his eyes been involved. But um, once you start having eye disease, and if you're a young age, and if you're male, these are all poor prognostic factors, and it's unfortunate for him, but it's, I mean, that's why I think we're doing such aggressive treatment at this point, is to try to save what, you know, the quarter of his vision that he has left, and the visual acuity is still good, thankfully, on the left eye, but um, I think 75% of Bichette's patients, once they start having eye symptoms, are blind within three to four years, completely, and, and it's usually bilateral. Thank you.